Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Teddy Payne and I will be your lecturer and I will serve as your, uh, your guide on our tour through world history. We will begin our course by looking at the development of civilizations as they rose around the world. Following the, this process, um, pretty much until the present, we will start off with the founding of the earliest city, the earliest urban centers in human uh, history. And we will continue our, our look, our examination of world history until we come roughly to the present, um, to the uh, to the 21st millennium, uh, 21st century, sorry. Um, I will present this course as close to chronological order as possible. In this course, I will explore and discuss more than just the events of history. We will delve into a narrative that inspects all aspects of culture, art, philosophy, religion, and, and so on. In doing so, we will have an opportunity to examine the nuts and the bolts of a civilization. This method also allows us to draw all similarities and differences between civilizations, particularly in the areas of problem solving and adaptations. During the grand narrative of our presentation, we will stop to examine some key texts, uh, we will look at new and interesting persons, persons who had a major impact on their culture, their civilization, and we will also look at new ideas from these civilizations that, that we will cover. Examples of this will be comparisons between, uh, let's say, Mesopotamia and Egypt, or Rome and Carthage, or the Aztecs and the Incas. Um, to begin with, I would like to define exactly what I mean and what generally we mean when we say civilization. Now, civilization, as we know it, is rightly defined as an urban-based phenomena. The attributes that are used as markers for civilization are the instruments typically found in cities. Uh, these are law codes, writing, and numerical systems, what we, what we think of as art, and innovations that generally ease life. Those are, are uh, the hallmark, the trappings of civilization. And they are all primarily associated with urban settings. Now, cities tend to nurture the development of such social instruments. Cities also produce uh, the, the singular individuals and group collectives that we will focus on. Now, I say this uh, to make a point that civilizations come in many forms and in this course, we will be discussing and basically uh, mostly covering urban-based civilization. We were really just going to cover urban history, that is, the history, uh, the history of cities and the civilizations that spawn cities. Now, because of what we will be in the cities and, and we will focus primarily on uh, the people from these cities, they we're really going to focus in on the, the aspects of, of, the, of those of those cultures, those civilizations. Now, I would also like to point out that um, throughout history, really for, for the majority of history, living in a city, uh, the events, um, the, the watershed moments in, of history that, that occur in the cities really didn't have that much of an impact. It really didn't involve the vast majority of, of, uh, of, of humanity. Uh, up until the, the the latest industrial revolution, the industrial revolution of the late uh, mid to late 17th, uh, 18th century that began in England and then spread uh, pretty much throughout all quarters of Europe and and uh, slowly permeated to the rest of the world in the 19th century. Uh, prior prior to that, most people didn't live in cities. The vast majority of the world population lived in rural communities. Uh, most of them were rural farmers or, or herdsmen. Um, and, and for a moment, I would simply like to point out that, uh, that, that, it, that it doesn't reflect the typical experience of most of humanity, um, particularly in antiquity. Uh, for much of the recorded world's history, members of, of uh, uh, human, humans have, um, have lived in these small communities. And, and while we're focusing on this, uh, on what can rightly be described as the atypical experience, um, a human experience, by focusing on these cities, I would like to sort of just take a step back and uh, and, and just provide this small caption for for the for the mostly farmers and and herdsmen who who are pretty much going to be left out of our journey. 
Now, for those living out their lives in these small rural areas, uh, they would have been born on a small farm. There would have been a higher probability that they would have died in childhood from disease. Uh, if they were lucky, they would have survived into adolescence and then spent a couple of years meagerly scratching out a living from the soil. They would scratch out just enough to stave off starvation. They would never travel more than 30 miles from their homes. They would never participate in any of the major battles of history. They would never see a king. Uh, they would never read a book. Uh, and in all likelihood, they would not even have been literate. Now, they never would have seen a great monument, uh, that, the great monuments of antiquity or the great works of art from antiquity. They never would have uh, heard a famous person speak. And they probably never would have even visited a city. They would also be unaware of the great events that we will cover for the most part. All of the development, uh, with the exception of farming innovations and, and other uh, sort of like farming or, or agriculture adjacent um, experiences such as beer or wine making, most of humanity never would have experienced. Maybe once in a while armed men would show up and take some of their crops and, and this would have been done in the name of taxation of a local elite or a king or just plain theft. Um, this description aptly applies across the millennia and across cultures from Mesopotamia and Egypt to China, uh, from India to Mesoamerica. This, this was the typical human experience. Uh, this was the universal experience of at least 80 to 85 percent of all humans who lived prior to the to the great industrial revolution the latest industrial uh, um, revolution uh, now another universal factor was mortality uh, specifically infant mortality between 20 to 35 percent of all babies died in infancy and childhood disease claimed many others women uh, had to successfully give birth from the onset of menstruation about five times just to keep the population stable and prevent a social collapse. If you were lucky enough to make it to your 20s, you would live a few more decades before dying. Uh, and, and that's if your civilization was not warlike. In the Roman Empire, it was estimated that only about 5% of the male population made it to middle age and that's because they were frequently at war with their neighbors and they were frequently fighting multiple wars on multiple fronts. So, so there was a, there's a lot of, a, a lot, I, I guess a lot of social pressures on these rural communities and then even if you made it out to rural communities and you made it to a city, there was still a lot of social pressures on you. Now our journey will take us, um, will, will, will take us uh, into examining the institutions and behaviors that will seem very familiar to ours. Now it is important to not leap to such conclusions. These civilizations inhabited a profoundly different world um, in terms of their trials and their tribulations than we do in ours. Uh, now, as any, uh, as any historian will tell you, it is uh, the very scarcity of sources for antiquity that will frustrate and delight you on your quest for knowledge. Uh, and this can be examined using a range of evidence that at times presents us with, with challenges and, uh, and really just sort of limit our ability to interpret history and to learn more about our predecessors. Uh, to begin with first, um, I, I would like to highlight an episode from the 19th century. Uh, and the 19th century was a time in which European scholars who, and this, in this first generation, they were really more akin to adventurers than, than, than scholars. Uh, they were going out and exploring the known world. They were going to places that nobody from their culture, nobody from Western Europe had been to before. And one of these explorers um, was a man named George Reisner. Now Reisner was an American, he was from the United States, but he had been brought up along the, the mid 19th century educational tradition. And he had, a, he had a small fortune and he went on to spend a number of years in the Nile River Valley. Uh, studying the ancient civilizations there. He examined the pyramids on the Giza Plateau and then he traveled down to Nubia and he examined the, uh, the pyramids in Nubia and he published a number of, of written works on his observations. In his writings uh, on the Nubian pyramids, he describes his theory on who built the pyramids in Nubia. And, and he said that um, uh, and in his writings, he went on to describe the dominant group who was responsible for crafting the social order there. Now, 
Reisner described in his writings how it, it was not the local African population there, uh, but another group who constructed the pyramids uh, and oversaw the creation of the flourishing states in Nubia. That the Nubians were only capable of going along with all of this because of their own long apprenticeship under the oversight of the Egyptians. Uh, Reisner was not alone in this opinion. That view was popular among 19th century academics and the nascent Egyptologist community. It would not be until later uh, that historians analyzed his works and poked holes in his views. Now, the moral here uh, in the story of George Reisner and his career, uh, the moral here exposes a danger that scholars often face when interpreting a new civilization other than their own. Reisner and his contemporaries allowed their cultural biases to cloud their judgment. Reisner were coming from the United States in the early 20th century, late 19th century. He was influenced by Jim Crow segregation. He was predisposed to interpret any discovery he made through the lens of his own cultural heritage and knowledge. Uh, he saw the great archaeological works. He saw Africans. He knew that a great degree of sophistication would be required to create such monuments. He subsequently deduced that the Africans could not have been capable of creating such works independently. Reisner, in his understanding of what he saw uh, and, and what he was discovering, was influenced by one thing. The general perception he had of Africans back in the United States at the turn of the 20th century, which was negative. He could not envision Africans having the intellectual or, techn or technological skills to independently order a civilization or go on to complete great public works. This story also highlights the dangers of making conclusions based on available archaeological evidence when there is a lack of companion sources like written records. Another point I would like to make uh, concerns drawing conclusions based off of sources when the ancient sources, the written records, are themselves biased. Uh, now, that is to say that the written sources are actively trying to distort perceptions. That is because most surviving documents only give one perspective of an event. Um, states and ancient writers intentionally misconstrued events to persuade audiences and influence subsequent generations. This is, uh, this is not a problem if we can compare multiple accounts against one another. With regard to ancient history, we also find, we often find that um, we only have one account that is overtly biased and that we have to approximate what really happened. Now, sometimes we can glean more information um, than, than the group or the author really intended to give us. For example, uh, the outbreak of the Second Punic War. Um, that, that is the, uh, the, the, the second major war fought between the Roman Republic and the Carthaginian Republic. Uh, both sides, now the Carthaginians and the Romans, they both signed a peace treaty dividing what is now the Iberian Peninsula between themselves. The Carthaginians were, um, well, 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 let me get backtrack a bit. The only copy we have to survive uh, of, that, of that treaty is a Roman copy. Uh, and the Roman copy is claimed to have been signed before the war, but we do not have any evidence to support that. We also do not have a, a Carthaginian copy to compare to the Roman copy. Now, the treaty explicitly states that the Carthaginians were not to cross the Ebro River, but it's quiet regar regarding the Romans being prohibited from crossing the Ebro River either. It's clear that the Ebro River is the, de is the demarcating line, the, uh, the, the demarcating ge um, geographic feature, but we don't have any um, prohibitions upon Rome and the Ebro River, just the Carthaginians. Um, now, now, this treaty is pretty obviously a work of propaganda. It is clearly meant to illustrate that the Second Punic War was a just war from the Roman perspective. It was a retaliatory war in the face of Carthaginian caprice. Now the text itself speaks loudly as it is devoid of Rome's obligations to Carthage, which stands in marked contrast to earlier treaties signed between the two, which contained obligations for both parties. Now, 
those uh, examples reveal some of the problems associated with interpretation. Now, I will relate to you moments that scholars still debate, uh, moments where our interpretation rests on shaky ground, and moments that still generate controversy among historians and lay people. Um, that, that is, uh, people who are not active historians, but are merely, uh, well, I, I don't want to say merely, but, but they're very, um, very interested in, in history and in the past. Uh, and and uh, there are a number of issues, a number of instances that still generate controversy amongst all groups. Uh, and I sort of lost myself in my notes. Okay. Uh, found myself. Now, this course is going to cover an enormous amount of territory. We're going from antiquity to the present, and we're, we're, we're going to do it in about 180 days. Uh, it's going to be a, a very quick um, a very quick presentation. Uh, well, not a very quick, but it's like it's a standard presentation for a course. Um, we're going to cover this enormous amount of territory. We're going to cover this enormous expanse of history and through our course we will always take note of the physical environment in which a culture develops and how that affects the way a culture evolves our early lectures will explore this we will also take uh we will also take note of the effects that arise when two civilizations collide through warfare through trade and through the typical cultural exchange between peoples Often these interactions spark key moments of transition. Examples of this would be the Roman Republic and other Italic peoples coalescing to create the Roman Confederation. The Roman Confederation, the Hellenic Kingdoms, the Gallic Celtic states, the Celtiberians, and the Carthaginian North Africa converging to create the Roman Empire. Various Germanic groups and the Western Roman Empire combining to create medieval Western Europe. Uh, events such as that. We will, we will, we will take uh, a keen interest, a keen look at events such as those. Innovations that will appear um, that, that will appear throughout our course will oftentimes appear parallel uh, across civilizations. Writing, farming, animal husbandry, those are all things that appear at, uh, at roughly the, uh, the same time in all civilizations. Everybody developed these um, these uh, these traits, these attributes, pretty much at the same time, and they all go forward with it. Uh, urban development, uh, living in cities, develop along the same time, and trade networks, long distance trade associations, they also develop uh, at roughly the, uh, the same time at different geographic spots along uh, across the globe. Now, contemporary global culture um, had its origins in antiquity, and so I invite you all to sit back. And enjoy our journey. And once again, I am Ted. I will be your guide on this uh, fantastic adventure. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. And I hope you guys enjoy the course.